everybody as you're joining on, I want everyone to share this broadcast. Invite your followers. Tonight is going to be powerful. I'm dealing with the word of God. Everybody, as you're joining on, I want you to share this broadcast. Invite your followers. And this is going to be powerful tonight. Blessings to everyone and blessings upon your week. And I wanted to share this special word going into your week. Everyone, blessings to you. Greetings to you. As you're joining on, share this broadcast. Invite your followers. And say, Lord, I receive the prophet's reward. Now, let's go to uh, Proverbs chapter. Let's go to Proverbs chapter 10. Verse 15. And saints, I encourage you. I, I have studied the book of Proverbs and the book of Proverbs have been the reason for all success in my life, all prosperity in my life and all wisdom in my life. And it's very good that you as a child of God study Proverbs in particular. Give yourself over to study in Proverbs if you want to live the God type of life. If you want to go high and you want to experience the joy of the Lord in its fullness. Remember what Jesus told the disciples? Ask what you will that your joy may be full. So if you want your joy to be full, Study Proverbs. Proverbs will give you a definition of the gospel like no other. You want to study the book of Proverbs and get understanding from Proverbs because there's a lot of your inheritance hidden in that book that you're not going to find nowhere. You're not going to find it in nowhere in the Bible as clear. So, we in Proverbs chapter 10, verse 15. Now look what it says right here. It says, the rich man's wealth is his strong city and the destruction of the poor is their poverty. Look at, look at this one more time. The rich man's wealth is his strong city and the destruction of the poor is their poverty. Now, saints, in this text right here is dealing with the rich man's wealth being his strong city. A strong city is like his refuge. It's a place of being shielded, protected, victorious. Because you know if your city is strong, that means nobody can overtake it and destroy it. Now look what the word of God says, that the destruction of the poor is their poverty. The word of God says right here that being poor and being impoverished, having lack, it will destroy you. Now let me get very clear here. It's talking about having the lack of money, the lack of provision. It's saying that if you have the lack of provision, the lack of money, the lack of substance, it will destroy you. And so we see that Satan has a destruction realm that keeps you small in money. Now, this is the word of God. So if God's word is telling us this, we know for a fact that this is ungodly. That is not the will of God. If you look at this text right here, you'll understand that if you're not making money and you're not experiencing the increase and the abounding, the abundance of money, that you are destroying yourself. Now, you may say that you're not destroying yourself, but the word of God tells you different. And if you believe that the word of God is the final authority, you will understand that if God is telling me this. There's obviously a money anointing that I'm supposed to embrace. There's a money anointing that I'm supposed to give heed to or else it will be. 
it will be out of pocket for God to tell me that I'm destroying myself with not with having lack, with having the overflow, with not having the overflow that is destructive. So I'm going to read this again. The rich man's wealth is his strong city. Now, it talks about the rich man's wealth. The rich man's wealth means that he has abundance. He has the abundance of money, the abundance of things, the abundance of substance. And the word of God is saying here that this is his strong city. And so he's living high, too high for the devil, too high for demons. Too high for principalities. They can't stop them. Now, the rich man's wealth is not only his strong city, it's his strong anointing. Because the power of God has given this rich man his wealth. The power of God has taken this rich man into the wealthy place. The power of God. And now... This rich man cannot be destroyed because he has an anointing on him from God. And hereby you understand why the Bible said in Ecclesiastes, um, I think it's chapter 7, verse 12, that money is, a, money is a defense and wisdom is a defense. Now you understand why the text was saying that is a defense. And that's correct, Ecclesiastes 7.12. Because money is actually a strong city. So it's defending you from being defeated. It's defending you from being um, overthrown, overtaken by demons. So hereby you see that how could a child of God truly be powerful if you have not won the victory with money. Because the word of God says that the Lord brought them out with their silver and gold. So if you say that the Lord has brought you out and you have been delivered from sin, why don't you have the money that comes alongside of the deliverance? Let's go to Proverbs chapter 10. Let's go to verse four. He becometh poor that dealeth with a slack hand. Now, saints, I want you to catch what the text say here. It says he becometh poor. If you become, that means that that wasn't your original state. The word of God says he becometh poor. That means that originally he was not poor. He became poor as a result of doing something. He became poor as a fruit of his decisions. Anytime you become something, that means that you originally was not it. But you did something corresponding with it, and now you have become what it is. So the word of God says, he becometh poor. He becometh in lack. He becometh void of money. He becometh uh, in the realm of lack. He becometh without Substance. He becometh poor that dealeth with a slack hand. Now, what is a slack hand? A slack hand is not working. Because God works six days, rested on the seventh day. And so work is a part of this equation. You have to put in the work. There's an assignment that the Father going to give to you that's going to bring money to you for sure. It's not living by faith. Uh, let's see if God going to bring something to me. No, no, no. There's a work that God going to have you do that for sure you're going to know that you're going to get some money. 
And if you don't have that yet, you know that you're not really working yet because a man is worthy of his wages. You see what I'm saying? He becoming poor. So, so I want you to see this. He was not already poor. He becomes poor. So he takes on this state of lacking because he's lacking to do something that's going to bring money. And when I say he, I mean male or female. I mean, I mean, whatever stature you are, if you're a male or female. Now, look at this here. He becometh poor that dealeth with a slack hand, but the hand of the diligent maketh rich. Let's go here. The hand of the diligent maketh rich. Look what the word of God says here. It says the hand of the diligent maketh rich. So the word of God is saying right here that the only way you can stop that demon of becoming poor, becoming in lack, is you have to receive diligent hands. Say, Father, I receive diligent hands. This is the only anointing power that could break the becoming of poor, the becoming of poverty, the becoming of lack. It says, but he, The hand of the diligent maketh rich. Now watch this, saints. I want you to see this. It says that diligent hands maketh rich. Now, if you catch something about the text, it says maketh rich. If, if you look clearly at how it's worded, whenever something is made, it means that it is invented. It means that it, it, it is um, it's created. So look what the word of God is saying here. That whoever has diligent hands invents riches in their life. They create riches in their life. They produce riches in their life. It's saying right here. That when you receive diligent hands, that you now become a entrepreneur of riches. You bring it into your life. You cause it to exist. You cause it to manifest, appear, spontaneously show up. But see, diligent hands is intentional productivity. Intentional. You see this? It's intentional productivity. It means that you know in your heart that you have a covenant with God. You know that God says that this is yours, this belongs to you. And so now you have the driving force to get things done and manifest this covenant plan of riches. So when it says that the hand of the diligent. You can't be diligent if you confused. You see what I'm saying? Because diligence requires you to continue in a divine instruction. Diligence is the ability to remain loyal, focused, committed to, A supernatural vision that comes from God. A supernatural vision that comes from the Holy Spirit. Are you catching this? You cannot be diligent without instructions. Diligence is when you have a revelation. And you proceed with that revelation without wavering. Diligence is when you've been taught something by the Lord, of the Lord, and you never divert from what was taught. 
Diligence is the exercising of divine knowledge. If you're taking notes, write that down. Diligence is the exercising of divine knowledge. That means that the Lord has let you know something and you refuse to get away from what you know. You refuse to leave what was imparted to you. Diligence means that you reject the option to be disloyal to your impartation. Are you catching this? Are you catching this? Diligence means that you refuse the option to be disloyal to your impartation. God has given you a knowledge about something and you don't let anything divert you. Now we in the word of God. Proverbs chapter 10 verse 4 says, but the hand of the diligent maketh rich. And so this is a maker's anointing. Now, diligent hands have everything to do with you. It has nothing to do with God at all. So this is your decisions. This is your actions. These are your fruits. You're doing this yourself. This is not God doing this. God is not doing it for you. Diligent hands is you, completely you. All right. Now, let me show you something. That's Proverbs 10, 4, Proverbs 10, 22. Now, we just dealt with the maker's anointing. So we see that when you have diligent hands, you have a maker's anointing on you. So you make money move. You make favor occur with God and men. Like you're putting this into action. You see what I'm saying? Like you're causing this to occur. Like it's not, it's not, um, you're doing this. You see? So when we deal with diligent hands, this is all your decision making. This is all your perseverance. This is all your focus. This is all your meditation on the word. This is all your receptivity of your covenant with God. This is all you. It has nothing to do with God. God is giving you the chance to make decisions that releases miracles and releases angels alongside of your life to minister for you. Now, saints, what I want you to catch is diligent hands brings ministering spirits that minister for you concerning your inheritance. And so everything that God promised you in the word, as you have diligent hands, these angels come alongside of you. So you not only move with diligent hands, but know that there's angels assigned to the diligent hands. Glory to God. Now I'm teaching real slow here because I want you to understand this. I don't want to go too fast and then you miss. Proverbs chapter 10 verse 4 talked about the diligent hands that maketh rich. And so there's a maker's anointing to have money that's unlimited when you have diligent hands. Now, remember what diligent hands is all about. When God reveals to you his will and you continue therein. When God shows you his promise and he gives you the prophecy and the direction to get there and you stay consistent with that path. Is when you know the good and perfect and acceptable will of God and you choose to remain faithful to it. You never get diverted, distracted, or become disobedient to what God has shown you. All right? So it is a soul covenant that you make with God. Diligence is a soul covenant that you make with God. And saints, you should write this stuff down. You should write this down. If you look at this in your notepad or your phone, wherever you write it down, it'll quicken you. Diligence is a soul covenant that you make with God. 
When you realize a soul covenant, that means that whenever your mind, will, and emotions want to entertain the demonic, you're going to remember, well, I made this covenant with God. So I got to be faithful to keep my mind, my will, and emotions in the presence of the Lord, in the leading of the Holy Spirit. I can't go to the left or to the right. And so it'll quicken you. It'll make you become knowledgeable of what you need to cast down. And saints, let me just tell you this. You can't have diligent hands if you have not cast down vain imaginations. You see what I'm saying? You're going to have to cast down vain imaginations. Because vain imagination is going to keep you out of producing what the Lord wants you to produce. Vain imaginations going to become a hindrance, a stumbling block. You're not going to be able to focus on what God is saying because those vain imagines going to create pictures in your mind that's going to make you contradict what God's saying, what God promised, and the anointing that God want to put on you. Vain imagination is going to uh, be a higher level of um, credibility. That's what you got to catch about vain imaginations. That's the devil moving with false credibility, but he's convincing you. Do you know whatever picture is playing in your mind is your reality? If you believe that everybody hates you, that's going to be your reality because all you see is hatred in your mind. And, and what does that produce? It makes you sad, insecure, make you feel hopeless. Because that's what you see in your mind. Vain imaginations is how Satan has kept the body of Christ and the people of God broke through vain imaginations. Because you never saw yourself as a millionaire. You never saw yourself as a billionaire. But the people that are becoming billionaires are in the world and they see their self like that. And that's why they're able to have clarity in their thoughts of how can I make this manifest? Because diligent hands maketh rich. Glory to God. Proverbs chapter 10 verse 4 says diligent hands maketh rich. So you understand that even people in the world are operating in diligent hands. Saints, I have something in common with a lot of people even of the world that became rich is that some of them slept in their office. I think Bill Gates, different ones, I think they slept in their office or, or some of them slept in their car. I've done that. But see, mine's wasn't from the world's point of view. I've slept in my car just so that I can sow seed, just so that I can honor God with my money because I realized that my life, my purpose was great. So I, had, I, I realized I was quickened by the Holy Spirit to make decisions that were sacrificial. See, sometimes you got to sacrifice where you are so that you can be comfortable when you go where you're going. See, nobody will ever take a hold of God-given wealth if they are unwilling to be sacrificial and uncomfortable in the present. Because that's the price you have to pay. And the Holy Spirit will lead you into all of this. It's not something that you just conjure up in your own understanding and say, let me do stuff like this. No, no, no. The Holy Spirit is the Lord of your life. He'll show you and guide you in all truth. You don't just pick stuff and make dumb decisions. Let the Holy Spirit guide your pathway. But once you surrender to him, you're going to see him directing you in the way that you should go. Remember what the word of God say in Proverbs. I think Proverbs chapter three, acknowledge the Lord in all your ways and he'll direct your path. Look what it says. You acknowledge him. So you act in the knowledge that he is the Lord of your life. You act in the knowledge that he is in control of your path, your future, your present. And when you act in that knowledge, you give him permission to release direction, which is a prophetic anointing. So you access the prophetic anointing for your life by acknowledging you acting in the knowledge. 
You, why are you acting in what knowledge? Is it the knowledge of education or is it the knowledge of God? The knowledge that you are born again. The knowledge that you are led by the spirit. Being led by the spirit is very easy. Very, very easy. Especially when your knowledge is being fed the word. Faith cometh by hearing. It doesn't come if by seeing. I did a teaching on Periscope. And those of you all that don't follow me on Periscope, I don't understand why. Why all of y'all watch me on here, but y'all won't download the app <laughs> and get on Periscope? I don't get you. You got a spirit of stubbornness. Why? How all y'all watch me on here, but you don't hop over on Periscope? Never mind. You, if you want to stay here, just stay here. I'm going to be on here. Don't, don't worry about it. If you want to stay here, you stay here. That's your preference. You feel free. But I did a teaching on how the blind men, the Lord Jesus said to them, do you believe that I can heal your eyes, open your eyes? And I did a teaching to my people. And I said that the blind men did not have the ability to look in the natural. Because remember, they're blind men. So how is Jesus asking them, do they believe? Do they have faith? Because faith doesn't come by seeing, it cometh by hearing. So that's why when you are subject to looking at your situation and what you're making and how your life has been, that's why it discourages you. Because faith does not operate by sight. Faith operates by hearing. And so you will not operate in the joy of the Lord and the faith of the Son of God, which is in Galatians 2.20. The Bible said that the life that I now live in the flesh is by the faith of the Son of God. You will not move in the faith of the Son of God if you are looking through your natural eyes. Your natural eyes is an adversary to your faith. Your ability to believe God with. Now, let me give you a definition of faith that you never heard before. Faith is having established confidence in the Lord's ability without considering that he cannot do it. Faith is established confidence in the Lord's ability without considering he cannot do it. That's what faith is. So it's an established confidence. Faith is so powerful because it means that you have not even taken time in your mind to consider that it may not even be possible. When you receive the measure of faith, you're not there. Now, understand that Romans 12 talked about the measure of faith because the measure of faith is just to jumpstart you. God gave you a foundation, meaning you got faith already on the inside of you. Now, imagine the measure of faith cannot get you to your promised land. The measure of faith, it, it was measured. Meaning God didn't give you the totality of what your faith can produce. He just gave you a measure. <laughs> so imagine how God gave you the measure of faith. So he measured it out. It wasn't the fullness of belief that you would have. He gave you a measurement of faith. Now your job is to build that measurement by hearing the word of God. Romans 10, 17, I believe. Faith coming by hearing, hearing by the word of God. So saints, this is why Jesus said in John 6, 63, that the words I speak to you are spirit and life. Because when he's speaking, and you're hearing him is imparting the Holy Spirit is imparting the life of God to your current measurement of faith. And when your faith is at an all time high, 
your body starts moving in the direct path that God wanted since the foundation of the world. When your faith is at the pinnacle, it starts moving in the direction. Your body starts moving in the direction that God wanted it to move. So you become led by the spirit. You become an uh, imitator of God, Ephesians 5.1. And then the Holy Spirit is able to uh, bring you into your land of plenty, your land of abundance. Now, let's go here. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 17. Look what it says. It says, do not be unwise. But understanding what the will of the Lord is. I want you to see this. It says, do not be unwise. But understanding what the will of the Lord is. That's the only way you can move in diligence. When you understand what the will of the Lord is, that's when you move in diligence. You cannot move in diligence until you understand what the will of the Lord is. If you don't know what the will of the Lord is, it's impossible for you to be diligent because you're going to have to know what am I supposed to protect and keep on doing? What is God saying to me that I keep on moving in? What is God instructing me that I keep on obeying? What laws have God given me for my life that I keep on protecting and moving in and mastering? So that's how you form diligence. That's uh, Ephesians 5.17. Now, Proverbs 10.4 talked about the diligent hands that maketh rich. Proverbs 10.22 says the blessing of the Lord maketh rich. Now imagine this. The diligent hands maketh rich. That's all you. But then the blessing of the Lord maketh rich. So what's going on here? The diligent hands actually activate the blessing. That's why Deuteronomy 28 says that these blessings shall overtake him that is diligently obeying the voice of God. The voice of the Lord. Look what it says. The, the blessing shall overtake him that is diligently hearkening to the voice of the Lord. So it reveals that diligent hands activate the blessing. And both of these make it rich. So diligent hands and the blessing are both spiritual weapons that make it rich. Now I want you to see this. Diligent hands activate the blessing. And I want to also say this, that when the blessing come, it activates another level of diligent hands. Because when the blessing come, remember what the Bible says, that the blessing was given to Adam in Genesis. And the Lord said, be fruitful and multiply. Which is also make it rich. Because multiplication is what riches shows. Riches produces. Riches birth. When you're rich, it means that you're fruitful and it means that you're multiplying. And so the mandate that God gave to Adam wasn't just for children. It was for provision as well. Now, we know that God was dealing with provision as well because he put Adam in the garden and told him, you can have all these trees. Enjoy them. But the tree of the knowledge of good and evil don't eat from that. So God let Adam know you can experience the enjoyment of life. Enjoy yourself. Enjoy all these trees. Now, saying some of you all never got the revelation of what these trees represented. These trees had assignments. There was a tree of health. So every time Adam ate from that tree, his body became energized. It's powerful. 
This is fresh revelation that I'm teaching you on here. When he ate from that tree, he felt energy. He felt energetic. He felt free from any sickness. He didn't feel sick. He didn't have a cold. He didn't have a flu. He didn't have no diseases. He had access to experiencing health in his body. There was a tree of wisdom. So every time he ate from that tree of wisdom, he experienced decision-making abilities that was downloaded to him from God. There was trees of prophecy. When he ate from this tree, he got directions. He knew which direction God wanted him to take, and he was able to also know the direction that these animals that were around him were supposed to take. He knew their direction because he had authority over the fish of the sea. The birds of the air. So that means that he knew the way of the eagle, all those different things. Think about that. So when he ate from the tree of wisdom, he ate from the tree of prophecy. He was carrying supernatural direction. He had the tree of love. When he ate from the tree of love, he experienced unselfishness. The ability to pick God first and listen to God about his woman, his wife. Listen to God about the animals. Because love makes you attentive to other people's safety. You see what I'm saying? Love makes you attentive to other people's enjoyment. When you walk in love, you start contemplating how can someone else experience pleasure, peace, and protection through me. When he ate from the tree of joy, he felt strength. So Adam had experience to all these trees and there was a tree of money. There was a tree for prosperity. There was a tree for wealth. When he ate from that tree, imagine how the Bible said in Genesis 2, 11, 2, 10, 2, 11, it talked about Havilah, the place where the gold was fine. There was a Havilah anointing that he was moving in, a Havila power of God. And he was able to tap into all of this when he ate from the tree of money. He had access to all these things. See, you got to catch this. God created things for you to enjoy these things. God created things to make you happy. That's why he created things. When you surrender your life to God, God want to give you things to show you levels of joy that you can step into. You ever had somebody give you a gift that you wanted? And man, look at how the joy you feel. Because God uses things to make you happy. That's why I said, seek ye first the kingdom of God, Matthew 6, 33, and all other things will be added unto you. Why is the Lord talking about things? Because he knows that things were created by him to make you happy. Even the Lord himself created things so that he can be happy. He created things to make him feel good. Think about this. And you've been made in the image and likeness of God. So God created things to make you feel good. That's, that's what he did. He did the same thing. He put that same mindset in you. Let's go to Revelation 4.11. It says, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory, honor, and power. 
For you have created all things for your perfect pleasure. They are and were created. Look, it says that you have created all things. That's Revelation 411. And for your perfect pleasure, all things were created. God created things to give him pleasure. He created things to give you pleasure. So money carries the happiness of God in it. When he gives it to you, it's not going to produce sorrow. That's what you got to catch about Proverbs chapter 10, verse 22. It's letting you know that when the Lord blesses you with money and he places a money anointing on you, this money will make you happy. It, it, why would the word of God said that it brings no sorrow? Sorrow takes away happiness. Sorrow and happiness are in two different brackets. When you're sorrowful, you're not happy. And when you're happy, you're not sorrowful. So God is saying that I'm going to make money come to you unlimited. And this is going to produce happiness in your life. So saints, um, get that demon out of your mind that money don't make you happy. People say that because they're trying to sound all super spiritual and super humble You can give a little child money and watch how they react. Go give a six-year-old child five dollars. Go give them twenty dollars and tell them you see you see how how quick they they respond. Have you been at a restaurant and you ever tip somebody a big tip and you see how they change? I've done that many a times. Some of y'all gotta be delivered from the spirit of not tipping. I've tipped people big tips many a times. I always do it. And, and their servanthood changes towards me. They pit me first. I start skipping people. <laughs> they start asking you if you want extra drinks. And then when I say drinks, I don't mean no daggone cocktails. Or no, no, no daggone cocktails. I'm not talking about no liquor. I'm talking about uh, 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 what? What? Uh, juice. <laughs> Nothing that gets you intoxicated. Huh? And so, imagine. Imagine. And, and let me just tell you this. God will bless you if you tip people. You, you need to know this. When, when you eat at a restaurant, um... If it's in your power, leave something behind for the person that served you. And the Lord will bless you and he will honor you. And that money will come back to you. I promise you that. There's something that happens when you reward people for their servanthood towards you. God looks at that and he blesses the work of your hands just because of that. Uh, when you reward people for ministering food to you, the Lord will look at that and he will multiply your money off of that. So I'm not telling you that you got to give your whole paycheck. I'm not telling you that. I'm telling you that leave something behind. You know your financial level. Leave something behind. It could be $5. Oh, the Spirit will help you. But leave something behind. If you ever go to a restaurant and you say, I ain't got nothing to tip. Well, let's be <laughs> All right. <laughs> um, now, son, I will tell you that we in 2019. So nowadays, they, they, you... If you, if you ladies go get your nail done, you go to the right one. They're going to demand a tip. <laughs> you understand? But um, giving should never be forced. Those of you who are in my ministry, you see how giving is not forced. And that's why I have a ministry of givers because I don't force. Min uh, giving is uh, something that you purpose in your heart to do. It got to come out of purity. It got to come out of a genuine place and it has to come out of the knowledge of how to walk in the love of God properly. 
And so given, uh, it should never be forced, but in our generation nowadays, they'll demand you to tip them. Um, the Holy Spirit will give you wisdom in all situations concerning those things. But um, it's good for you to leave something behind. Now, I will be honest with you. I've been places where service was bad and the Lord told me to walk out and I didn't eat none of the food. I didn't do nothing. I just walked out because the vibe, the the spirit that was within the people was not right. And I want to also tell you that as, as a prophet, you're going to know when you step into an area, what type of spirit dominates that area, especially if the Holy Ghost has taken you over. I had took all my band out to an area one time after we finished uh, practicing or, or recording or whatever. And we was at the restaurant. All of us was there together. And the, the, the people there really had a lack of excellence. We waited there for over some time. And the Holy Spirit said, son, let's rise up and go. And so I obeyed him immediately. I got up and left. I wasn't worried about nothing. I obeyed the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit will look out for you. People might not look out for you, but the Holy Spirit will look out for you. And so uh, this whole life is about being led by the Spirit. See, I can tell you right now, hey, don't give somebody a tip. I can tell you, give somebody a tip. But see, at the spirit of the moment, the Holy Spirit may have a different instruction for you concerning that matter. And that's the power of being led by the spirit. And that's the, that's the adventure and the fun of being led by the spirit. Because you may be in a situation and, and that's why a lot of people are messing up. People are hearing from people speak widely and say, if somebody do this to you, you should do this back to them. And, and if, so, if, you, if, you, if you're in a relationship like this, somebody do it. No, no, no. You can't really tell somebody that. What if a woman is in a relationship or a man is in a relationship and something is going on that's awkward and the Holy Ghost is telling them to stay there? You can't tell them, hey, worldwidely, if something happens like this, you got to leave. You can't do that because the Holy Spirit may be telling that person, I want you to stay here for three more weeks because I'm going to do this and do this and do this and do this. See, everything is about being led by the Spirit. You can't tell people, hey, if you go here and dot, 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 make sure you do this. No, no, no. You can't even tell somebody how to cast out a devil. Because not all devils come out the same way. Anybody that's been in deliverance ministry will know that some evil spirits come out not by just in the name of Jesus. So there's different methodologies. God may tell you to swing your hand. God may tell you to lay hands. God may tell you to get some oil. The Bible said that Apostle Paul took his apron. And he took it, and this is how. He released deliverance in the life of the people that were possessed with demons. So if one of the disciples only cast out devils with a word, or they cast out devils by laying up hands, and they saw Apostle Paul doing that, if they are immature, they're going to look at Apostle Paul and say, no, that's demonic, Apostle Paul, you shouldn't do that. But that's the way that the Holy Spirit wanted Apostle Paul to do, which is take the apron, take the handkerchief and disperse it to people. And when they touch the handkerchief as a point of contact, the Holy Spirit was going to manifest and release deliverance in their life from the demon spirit that was possessing that person. So oftentimes, that's why a lot of people never become who they want, who God wanted them to be, because you listen to someone that told you how to do it. That's why it's very scary if you listen to someone else's technique of how they moved in the anointing. What if your technique is different? What if somebody got the anointing by a 40 day fast? What if God not telling you to go on a 40 day fast? You go on that 40 day fast, you're going to die. There's many men of God, many are, or there's many people that are uh, religious, that have gone on fast and have died during the fast. How could you die during the fast? Because God didn't send you on the fast. If you do anything without God, even if it's spiritual, you open yourself up to the spiritual realm and demons can attack you when you're, self, uh, when you're accessible. Here's what I want you to see. When you do anything 
like fasting, you're opened up in the spirit realm. There are some people that go on a fast and come out of that fast more addicted to sin than when they started that fast. Why, if people do things that are deemed spiritual, why do they come out addicted to certain things? And they, why? Have you, saints, there are people that have tried to spend time with God. And after they tried to spend time with God, they had an urge to do something demonic. There are people that tried to spend time with the Lord. And while they was trying to spend time with the Lord, after they did that moment, they went go do various sins that they were set free from. Why does that happen? Because you open yourself up in the spirit realm. And if you're not fully committed, that's why Apostle Paul was saying you got to be fully persuaded. If you're not all the way in, you are going to get bored. And you out of boredom will be linked to old habits that you, you used to do. And you're going to, because you didn't feel the pleasure from the presence of God, you're going to look for pleasure from the demonic. That's exactly what happens. What takes place. When you don't feel. Pleasure. From the presence of God. Demons come talk to you because you opened up in the spirit realm. And they'll say, come on, let's go do something that's going to bring us instant pleasure. That's why you never seek God with the pursuit of instant pleasure. And I had to learn this, but I, I learned this very young because I remember when I was young, I would see people moving the anointing. So I even thought, OK, I'm going to move in the anointing immediately. And the Lord had to teach me. The Bible said that though he was a son, Hebrews chapter five, eight. He learned obedience by the things he suffered. Suffered means that he did not seek instant gratification. Suffer means that he did not feel instantaneous pleasure, uh, 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 pleasure instantaneously. It means that he didn't get instant gratification. He was stretched by the father. To do things without feeling pleasure while doing it. So that's what you understand that he learned obedience. And so if you ever seek the Lord, never seek the Lord for instant gratification. That's what a lot of people do. Some people sow seeds for instant gratification. That's why they get disturbed about sowing. Because you're not going to become rich off of sowing one seed. You're going to have to learn how to be a sower. If you try to get rich off of one seed, once you get rich, you're not going to want to sow no more. And you're going to abort the purpose of why God put that riches in your hand. Because God not putting riches in your hand for you to sow one seed. He put riches in your hand for you to be a sower and distribute that money where it's supposed to go. What if you get $70,000 from the Lord and the Lord said, I want you to invest 50,000 in this building. You know what you're going to do? No, no, no. I want to invest 70,000 into what I want to do. No, no, no. See, now you're wrestling with God because you're not a sower. And so now he can't control that money. You telling him what you're going to do with that money. And watch this here. When you're not a sower, you already make plans for that money before it gets into your hands. And you make yourself stumble because now the first thing when God give you instruction is going to be a burden to you. It's going to be burdensome. It's going to weigh you down. It's going to make you unhappy because you have already made up in your mind what you're going to do with that money. But when you are sower, it's easy for you to listen to the father. And even before you get that money, you realize that the Lord may tell me to do something with it. So let me not pit my life into this. 
That's why the Bible said that the love of money is the root of all evil. Because when you love money, that means that you become intimate with money. When you love money, that means that you become uh, in a soul tie with money. That means that your mind, will, and emotions become one with money. And that means that now money has a part in your life. It can tell you what to do. It can influence your decisions. And you will shut off the Holy Spirit just to get that money. Or just to keep that money protected in your bank account. Saints, do you see why sowing was created by the father? Because the father wanted to get you free from being in love with money. He wanted you to know that it is your servant, not your master. It is a slave, not a God. So it was never supposed to determine your mood. It was never supposed to determine your mind. And it was never supposed to determine your movements. Can, can some of y'all write that down? You should write that down in your notes or watch the replay. Money was never supposed to determine your mood. It was never supposed to determine your mind. And it was never supposed to determine your movements. Money was never supposed to decide your atmosphere. Your reaction to God. And so when you're sowing, you receive the sowing anointing from God. It is a separation and a deliverance from letting money dominate you. I know every time money leaves my hands, I receive a boldness from God to trust him and him alone. I know from experience that every time I sow, my faith begins to reach for higher measures, higher mantles, higher encounters with God. Sowing is so powerful because when you're sowing, you're opening up yourself to the Lord Jesus and telling the Lord Jesus, I want your will for my life. Now, you don't just sow anywhere. The Holy Spirit he has the strategy for your sowing. There is a soul that your sowing will work in. The father taught me that um, You sow where you're led and you sow where you're fed. He gave me that statement because in, in ministry, I've had people ask, where do you sow? You sow where you're fed, you sow where you're led. Your God ordained soul will always quicken you to deeper knowledge, stronger wisdom, greater revelation. Your God-ordained soul will be a electrifying impartation that hits your soul. And you'll know that it's changing you as you're listening to it. That's, that's how you... Receive your soul from God. When a man of God is ministering, it's like he's feeding you food. And see, you remember I just was telling you about tipping your waiter. Because they are part of feeding you. And then you pay for the meal that you bought. And that's, that's, that's what goes on in ministry. In ministry, when a man of God been sent to you, they're teaching you, or a woman of God, if God decides to send a woman to you. That prophet 
is feeding you. And so when you cooperate with that prophet and you're so into that prophet, you receive what is called the prophet's reward. And the prophet's reward is whatever that person wants in return. The prophet's reward is various things, it's manifold. Number one, you must know that the prophet's reward is always prosperity. Because the Lord said, if you believe the prophet, so shall you prosper. That means that you're going to be successful in whatever you desired. And you're also going to be successful in achieving the plan of God for your life. But the Lord has a dimension where he said, ask what you will, that your joy may be full. John 14, 14 said, if you ask anything in my name, I will do it. So when you sow into your prophet, the person that's feeding you the word, that's giving you direction, that's giving you wisdom. You sow and you receive the prophet's award. You receive success. You receive a financial empowerment because that's what you're sowing. You're sowing money. So you're receiving an empowerment of money. The prophet's reward is a wealthy place. So it's impossible for you to sow into a prophet that God has sent to you and not become rich. Because the prophet's reward is prosperity, is wealth, is abundance. You see that in the word of God. That's why the prophet went to the woman at Zarephath and told her, you give me your last meal. I want you to sow because that was her level of currency. She didn't have no money. Remember that. All she had was her last meal. She was broke. She didn't have no money of any kind. So he said, take your greatest form of currency. This is your greatest form of livelihood. And I want you to sow that into me. A prophet is rich soul. When God sent a prophet to you, they, they carry in the power of the Holy Spirit to make you a financial Magnet, a money magnet, a wealth magnet, a money mover. Money will move for you in this life. And we live in a financial world. This whole world is governed off of finances. Now the earth is governed off of God, but the world is governed off of finances. The world and the earth are two different things. And see, I'm giving you revelation as we talk in here. The earth. is what God created. But the world is a system that was produced as a result of sin. And this system has robbed God's money. And there have been many people that have come into covenant with this system and have made money off of this system called the world. But see, the Bible said that the earth, the all creation is crying out for the manifestation of the sons of God. When the sons of God manifest, the sons of God are led by the spirit and the spirit of God leads you into sowing. It leads you into the law that governs money. It leads you into the law. That governs provision, which is seed time and harvest. So watch what the Lord said. It, he didn't say as long as the world remains. He said as long as the earth remain in Genesis chapter 8, I believe. Genesis chapter 8, I believe. 8, 21, 22, I believe. It's somewhere around there. As long as the earth remains, not the world. The, as long as the earth remains, there'll be seed time and there'll be harvest. Now, saints, I want to shock some of y'all. The Lord said, as long as the earth remains. Now, you, some of you all may think, well, after we die, there's no, going to be no more seed time and harvest. Remember what the word of God say in Revelation, that there shall be a new heaven and a new earth. So when the word of God says, 
that there is a new heaven and a new earth. That means that the seed time and harvest law will remain for all eternity. Because it says as long as the earth remains. There's going to be a new earth. So really the seed and the sowing idea of God is an eternal law that brings eternal abundance, eternal harvest. When a child of God steps into the seed, things simultaneously start to happen. And the father releases his favor, his government into their life. Proverbs chapter 10, verse four, the other side of diligent hands is working. But the other side of diligent hands is worshiping. And see, the Bible said that the father seeketh those that will worship him in spirit and in truth and talked about true worshipers. True worshipers are people that worship out of sowing. That means that you take what you have and you sow it. It means that now you are using what God puts in your hands as a weapon to show him appreciation. And, and the Lord gets energized off of your sowing. That's something that people must catch. That the seed principle is the food of God. He eats your worship. He eats your sowing. That's why you're not supposed to eat your seed. Because the Lord, that's his meal. He eats your seed. He eats your honor. When you sow a seed, God getting fed. God experiencing pleasure off of your sowing. So the Bible said that Solomon loved the Lord and he sold a thousand burnt offerings. See, God was eating that seed. So then God, after he was full and he enjoyed the meal, he came to Solomon, I think by a dream, and told him, ask what you will that I may give it to you. Sowing will pick God in a mold of supplying you whatever you dreamed about. When a child of God step into sowing, your life going to take off because now the father going to start dealing with your preference, what you enjoy, what you like, what you want to experience. Now, sowing with diligent hands will bring you into riches. God will give you a soul so that you won't be confused. He'll give you a soul to sow into. And that person will be like a Melchizedek. Every time you sow into them, you're going to experience God's financial blessings. And not only financial blessings, but it deal with every other department. It deal with your health. It deal with your mind. It deal with your relationships. It deal with your joy. It deal with your deliverance. All the realms of God. Is manifested when you sow. A lot of times, the people of God have been blinded from this realm, and so they live poor lives. You ever met people of God that's always believing God for a miracle? That's not even your destiny. Believe in God for a miracle. It, you only believe God for a miracle all the time because you lack wisdom. That's the only reason why. You have authority over all things through the blood of Jesus and through your sonship. There is nothing in this life that has been withheld from you that's in the word. The Bible said that he withholds no good thing from those that walk uprightly in Psalm 84. There's nothing in the word that he withheld from you. Everything belongs to you. 
Everything belongs to you. Your sowing account will reveal to you whether or not you're on fire for God. You all know if you're on fire for God. There's people that never sow nothing and then they say, I love God. You don't love God. It's impossible for you to love and not be a cheerful giver. And it's impossible for you to love God and not see where God is using someone for your behalf and not be moved to giving to them. It's impossible. So God created the seed principle also to let you know where you stand as a child of God. To let you know where your heart is. Because nobody that's in love with God will lack in sowing. When you love God, it'll make you work. It'll make you get a job. It'll make you sow seeds. It'll make you be diligent with your working hands, your sowing hands. Because that's how you love God. Now also, I want to mind you that I had to learn this as well. I, le I learned this rather early. I remember being at the age of uh, being a teenager and the father starting to branch me out into the kingdom mindset because a lot of people don't have a kingdom mindset. They have a religious mindset, a traditional mindset. I prayed to receive Jesus. Jesus is all I need. And then they live their whole life not having no money. And then they live their life never being rich. Well, how much of Jesus you could have released to people if you was rich? You got the love of God in your heart. You know how many people you could have blessed. You could have bought somebody a car. You could have bought somebody a house. Mind you, I have done all those things. Imagine how much, if you love Jesus so much, imagine how much you could have showed the love of Jesus to people. And so sowing is so important that you walk in this kingdom mystery because you got money that you're supposed to take a hold of for kingdom purposes. If you have a mindset that you only, I just need enough for me and that's all I need. I'm a humble person. I don't need all that other stuff. I just need enough for me and I'm good. I serve my God. I, I'm not worried about all that stuff. I'm just concerned about souls. I love God. That's all I want. Yeah, you sound like a dummy. <laughs> you sound like a fool. If you love God so much and you love souls so much, why wouldn't you let God make you rich for you to be a blessing to those souls that you say that you love? How special thou art. You sound like a fool. You know, the gospel is it's not about money or none of that stuff. It's just about souls. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You sound like a fool. How about when you win those souls, you, you're able to take them out to a restaurant and feed them? How about when you win those souls, you're able to buy them a car and say, hey, you know, Jesus love you. But watch this here. Watch what I'm about to do. I'm about to buy you a mint coat because it's cold outside. I want you to be clothed. I know that you're hungry. I just want you to the Lord. Let me go take you out and get you a meal. What you like to eat? But see, the ch but people like that can't do that. Because they broke. And they love Jesus so much. That's, that's all they right, right. I don't believe nobody loved Jesus so much if you ain't got no money. Because if you love Jesus so much, it's going to be impossible for you not to have no money. Because you're going to want money. Because you're going to want to show people how much you love Jesus and how much Jesus loves them. Children of God, wealth is in your DNA. It's impossible for you to love God without wealth. It's impossible. I'm going to say it again. It's impossible for you to love God perfectly without wealth. Because wealth is going to pit in your power to show people the magnitude, the height, the depth, the greatness of your God. That's what wealth does. You properly represent God. Remember you his child. Saints, I got two daughters in the earth. I only got two children. I have two daughters that came from 
my loins that came from me. I created them. Two daughters, and we give glory to the Father in heaven. I have two daughters that came from me. And I want both of my daughters to enjoy life. I never let my daughters starve. I never let my daughters be naked. And I don't want to just feed them. I want them to eat the finest foods. I don't just want to dress them. I want them to wear the finest clothes. So I take them shopping. You know, a little child grows constantly, but I don't care about the growth. I want them to enjoy the best now. Now, see, our generation are so foolish that we call it spoiling the child. When really all you doing is just tapping into the father's mindset of how he want to treat all his children. The Lord, sometimes you looking at stuff, Thomas, and you know, you know, and the Lord saying, no, no, I want to give that to you. Saints, do you know how many times God will let you see a fast car driving on the highway and he say, you want that Lamborghini? And you say, no, 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 I, I, I'm not, I'm, I'm okay. And the father looking at you like, wow, all right. And he shut that option down. He wasn't telling you to go pay for no Lamborghini. He wasn't telling you to go pay for that Lamb truck or that BMW truck. He wasn't telling you to go pay for it. He was just asking you, do you like it? And he know good and well that you like it. You say, well, well how does this bring glory to God? <sniffs> Baby, it brings glory to God when God is able to do in your life what he wants to do because you are his child and he want to treat you with luxury. I did a teaching on how there's cars in heaven and how there's food in heaven. And I've heard people ask, well, how, why would God have food in heaven? Why he want food in heaven? Why he want cars in heaven? God created things for your enjoyment, for your pleasure. The only reason why you done stepped into this need mindset was because of the curse. That's why David was trying to renew your mind in Psalm 23. Said, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Wait a minute. I thought we dealing with knees, David. How are you talking like that? Now, saints, you, you, David understood this realm. You understand? He understood this realm, how God gives you what you want. But a lot of people in the body of Christ have never known this realm. Many people have never stepped into God giving them what they want because you live your whole life restrained. You live your whole life as a slave. And some of you all don't believe that you're a slave. But yeah, you're a slave. You're a slave to what your job give to you. You're a slave to that, that SSI check. You're a slave to those food stamps. Do you know that the creator of the universe got provision that you have not taken a hold of? The Lord, when he said he's going to give you abundant life, that don't got nothing to do with what you need. That means he's going to exceed your need. He's going to give you surplus for you to enjoy yourself. Now, saints, I'm going to tell you like this. The more God gives to me, the more money God gives to me, the more clothes God gives to me, the more I work for him. So your heart got to be right. I can go anywhere in the world right now. I can travel anywhere I want to go. There's nowhere in the state or across the world on this planet Earth that I can't travel right now. I got my passport. I got all type of, I got every legal document. I got minister license, all that. I can do what I want, but I'm led by the spirit. And that's what I want you to see. So your heart got to be right. The, 
the Lord don't want to give you abundance and then it it it, um, it corrupts your momentum. So that's why God trains you. He trains you to sow so that your mind will always be in the place that Jesus must be first. It's not about what I want to do. And saints, let me just tell you something. Wealthy people think different. See, you got to go somewhere to feel joy. Or oh, I got to go on this vacation. No, no, we have a vacation every time we enter the presence of God. Every time we are in the presence of God, we experience vacation. See, a lot of people, they, they live above their means before time. You put yourself in debt. And wrong spending has also kept a lot of children of God broke. Wrong spending. Wait your time. Never, I, I got a law, I always tell people, never buy a car that you're not going to enjoy the payments on. Because that's what a lot of children got missed too. You go buy a car because you got income tax. But now you got to pay all this, this and it's beating you over the head. And saints, let me just tell you this. Never buy anything with your money that's going to stop you from being able to honor God. Never buy anything from the money you have that's going to interrupt your ability to sow. Because saints, some people buy things, it take up your whole income. You make money, you got to pay for all the stuff that you done bought. That was not wisdom, child of God. And now you robbing God. And when you're robbing God, he can't bless you. And a lot of you all in 2020, how are you going to take a hold of your God-given wealth if he can't trust you? How the Lord going to put riches in your hands if he can't trust you? Because the little that you got right now, you already proven to him that you're not going to be a good steward. Never go purchase anything with your money if it's going to take away the power for you to sow bountifully into your God. I learned that as a young man. I was willing to give away everything I had just so that I can clear up space to obey God and sow. And for those of you all that don't got a problem with this, I'm not talking to you. I'm, I'm saying as a child of God, you never want to put yourself in a predicament where your hands are going to be tied and you can't sew. And you got to make decisions. Am I going to pay for this car that I bought prematurely or I'm going to sow seed? And then you got to pick the car because you don't want the car to get repossessed. Says, do you know sometimes repossession is a blessing? When you lose something, you got the power to worship God. And sometimes you go try to get it back. Oh, I need it back. I, no, no, no. You don't need it back, baby. You're not a sower. Now, you don't need it back. You'll get it back when you learn how to pick the Lord first with your money. He'll give it to you as a harvest. But it's not a harvest right now. That's why it's bringing you sorrow. Saints, when you look at stuff in your life and that, that bill, that thing is bringing you sorrow, it's because it's not a harvest. That's why it's so burdensome to you. When God gives you a harvest, you're going to have the power to take care of that thing and you're going to have power to still sow into your God bountifully. But see, sowing is the secret to getting prosperity and wealth and receiving it and having the power to enjoy it and still take care of the Lord Jesus Christ with his vision. You don't want to get $50,000 and try to go buy a house. $50,000 is not no house money. $50,000 is not even car money. Or, or don't buy a $30,000 car and you got $50,000. Because if you add it up, the car payments that you're going to make on that $30,000 car that you just bought is going to add up to you waiving that $20,000 that was remaining. See, you, you, saints, if you receive financial wisdom, you're not going to need financial miracles. If you receive financial understanding, you're not even going to need financial borrowing. People got to borrow money because they're not listening to the father. And then sometimes you got your priorities wrong. You don't want to handle stuff with the money, but then you want to go buy clothes. 
No, go handle your business. Wrong spending is a spirit that has attacked the body of Christ. You spend money wrong. And you don't handle the priorities at hand. Your lights done got cut off because you went go buy the Louis Vuitton boots. No, go pay for your light bill, baby. Go pay for your light bill. Stop, stop being so compulsive with what you see. There's a time coming where you're going to enjoy yourself. Now, now you can't tell me nothing. Because I got so much Louis Vuitton stuff. I got so much Gucci stuff. It, 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 it'll, it'll drive you crazy. But saints, I didn't get no Gucci stuff when I was sewing. And if you would have told me to go to the Gucci store, go to the Louis Vuitton store, you wasn't going to see me there. Because I knew that God had me training me and I, it was all about him. And, and I like wearing brand name clothes now. But there was a time where I didn't wear brand name clothes for years. There was a time where I didn't put on no jewelry for years. Some of y'all see me wear jewelry. I had gave away my jewelry. I didn't wear jewelry for over, what, over four years of my life. I didn't wear necklace, earring. I didn't wear bracelet. I didn't wear rings on my finger for a whole four plus years. I didn't wear no type of jewelry of any kind. You didn't see one piece of jewelry on me for 365 days, four times. I didn't wear nothing. So now when God give you jewelry, it's a harvest. Because that's what you gave up to him. And whatever you give to the Lord, it multiplies. Every child of God must learn how to sow. Because you was created to be wealthy. You have too much of the power to get wealth given to you in the word of God for you to refuse this lifestyle. If you want to live a biblical life, you can't live a biblical life without receiving wealth. And then saints, the Bible said in uh, Galatians that the blessing of Abraham has come upon you and you are sons of Abraham, it's impossible for you to be a son of Abraham and not receive the riches anointed. Because Abraham was very rich. So if he is your father, how come you refuse what your father lived in? Now we know that being rich and wealthy and having plenty of money is not against God's will because that would be an oxymoron for God to pit plenty of money in Abraham's hand and then pit a whole blessing after him and then didn't then want you to have no money. There'd be a moxymoron. But wrong spending has stopped the body of Christ. Wrong spending. You buy things before time. You spend beyond your means. And then you pitch yourself in a deficit. Because now your finances is not at the place it's supposed to be. And that's how you destroy your financial future. It's very dangerous. You have to listen to the Lord with the money that he pits in your hands. And after you receive a job, understand that your job is not the way that God is going to take care of you. Your job is for you to take care of God. He has an invisible account, an invisible system and government that has riches and wealth in it that he going to supply to you. And let me deal with this. You must know the angel that deals with all of God's money affairs. And his name is the minister of finances. When a child of God is sowing into their God ordained soul, their man, their woman of God that God has sent to unlock them, teach them the word, impart to them, take them to new levels, glory to glory in the spirit. When they are sowing into a God-ordained soul, the minister of finances will minister for your life. What did the word of God say? Are there not ministering spirits sent forth to minister to those that are the heirs of salvation? The minister of finance is going to come on the scene. And the minister of finance is going to start ministering to you supernatural money. That's why you hear me talk about supernatural money. This is a real realm. I've experienced it. I've had supernatural money come to me various times, especially in the days where I was sowing. I remember one time I recall one day I had sold some seed. And I was in the land of Texas at the time. And 
I remember the Holy Spirit gave me an instruction to go to a place that evening. And I looked at my gas in my car and I said, how can I get to that place and get back to my place? without my car breaking down because I realized I didn't have enough gas and I had already sold some money. I had sold my best seed. I think it was, you know, a couple hundreds of dollars. So the Lord had me call my bank account. When I called my bank account, there was hundreds of dollars that appeared in my bank account. Now, mind you, previously, my bank account had a deficit. Now I'm calling and there's money deposited. It wasn't money that just showed up from a prior transaction. It was money that was deposited. Now the bank was confused. The bank said, um, uh, yes, this is a deposit, but it says that the, the depositing, the, the person that put it in there is unknown. And they said, let's do an investigation and stuff like that. They was trying to find out. They couldn't find our actual source, and they was confused. And saints, here's the mighty thing about this. Nobody had access to my bank account. Nobody had access to that bank account. There was nobody that had the access to get into that bank account. That bank account was a secretive bank account that I had made that nobody had access to that bank account. And so when I realized that the bank was trying to get in the natural, try to figure out what happened supernaturally, the, the lady said, well, Mr. Holmes, well, let's do an investigation since you don't know where it came from. I said, I know where it came from. I said, thank you. I said, I just remember where it came from. Thank you so much. And, and, and I hung up. I took that money and I went go accomplish what God told me to do. And I went go sow some more money. I took that miracle money that God gave me and started sowing it. And saints, that's why I want you to catch too. A lot of times God going to give you a financial break and you're going to have more money and you're supposed to take that money and plant it back in the ground. There's a lot of people like you'll get a little financial increase and you go take that money and you think, oh, oh, I got it. And you go take that money and go enjoy yourself. You can flip that money and multiply it if you sow it. And God will give you. And do you know that that money came back to me? Multiply. It. Money will multiply itself in your life if you know how to take it. And sow it. And let it come back to you. And so I realized that that was my, not my finale. And God had more money for me. So I took that money and I put it right back into the gospel. I put it right back into my man of God. It's very powerful. Once, once you become a steward of money, the Lord will not let any money lack in your life. He'll keep taking you into the glories of riches and wealth. And that's what he really wants to do. Let's go to Proverbs chapter 8. Let's go here. Verse 17. Proverbs eight seventeen says this. And I love them that love me. And those that seek me early shall find me. Now, mind you, this is the angel wisdom talking. And she is a female angel. The angel of wisdom. Those of you all that follow me closely, if you, are, you have heard of my teachings, you will know about this wisdom angel. Look what the word of God says here. I love them that love me and those that seek me early shall find me. So saints, what does it mean to seek wisdom early? That means seek wisdom when you don't even feel like anything bad is happening. Seek the wisdom of God when you feel like everything is going well in your life. See, saints, I don't call upon God for wisdom because I'm confused. I call upon God for wisdom because I want to stay in the flow of never being confused. You see, I've learned how to move in wisdom, not off of, a, a, hey, I don't know what to do. Even when I know what to do, I still pray for wisdom. And children of God, that's what you got to learn to do in your personal life is that you got to learn how to cry out for wisdom 
when it looks like everything is peaceful in your life. Seeking God early is not just waking up at 5 a.m. Seeking the wisdom of God early means early before trouble comes. Early before opposition comes. Early before uh, persecution comes. Early before famine comes. I love them that love me and those that seek me early shall find me. So the angel of wisdom is saying here that if you look for her, you're going to find her. She not going to hide from you. And that's why the book of James chapter one, verse five, um, I think it's James chapter one, verse five and on. It talks about if any man asks for wisdom, the Lord will give it to him liberal, liberally. You know what that means? Freely. There's no requirement. You can be black, white, fat, skinny. Uh, you can be sick, healed. You can be rich, poor. You can be in the city. You can be in the field. You can be working. You can be a slave. It don't matter where you are. He's going to give you wisdom. And that wisdom is going to bring you out of that situation and bring you into the joy of the Lord, which is which means that you're going to have what you wanted to have. And you're going to have what he wanted you to have. Look at verse 18. After she says, seek me and you will find me. She says this, riches and honor are with me. Now, saints, this is powerful. Look what she says here. Look at what the wisdom angel says. She says, riches and honor are with me. Saints, I'm telling you this kingdom of God for wealth is powerful. This kingdom of heaven for riches is powerful. Look what she says here. Riches and honor are with me. And then look what she says after that. Yes, durable riches and righteousness. Durable riches and righteousness. Look what she says. Riches and honor are with me. Yes, durable riches and righteousness. Look what she's saying here. She's telling you that she is accompanied with riches and honor. You know what honor means? It's a word that represents investment. So it means that the investment power of God, meaning God taking the time to pour out his blessing on you. That means God taking the time to pour out his wealth, his provisions on you. So, so she's saying that I have the power for investment. And I have the power to get people on the earth to invest in you. Remember what the Lord Jesus said. He said, give and it shall be given unto you. Luke chapter 638. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, shall men, shall men, that's honor. Shall men give into your bosom, that's honor. So she has the power to activate investors in this life. But look what it says here. It says, yea, durable riches and righteousness. Look at what she is saying here. Not only does she has plenty of money. She has eternal money, durable riches. This riches will not expire in a couple years. You see this? It will not expire over time. What she telling you that she has the ability to flow finances in your life constantly. 
Now, saints, mind you, this is in your Bible. So you can't say, hey, this is a false doctrine. This is in the word of God. You can't say, hey, this is just a made up ideology. This is what's in your covenant. This is in your covenant. This is what God has given to you to possess. And that's why you got to become focused. Don't let people distract you. Become intentional about your life and become intentional about this word. Remember James talk about being a doer of the word? Well, I'm showing you what, what's in the word that you're supposed to do. Let's go to Romans chapter 8, verse 32. It says, he did not spare his own son, but he delivered him up for us all. How shall he not also with him freely give us all things? Look at what the text is telling us here. It says that he gave his son freely. How much more will he give you all things? Saints, because Jesus was the greatest thing that the father gave. Jesus was the greatest thing that the father sold for you. Invested in you. So he's saying, now that I gave you my best, all these things underneath Jesus, I'm going to freely give you those things. See, this is the life of a sower. What God start giving you freely things for you to richly enjoy. Look at what it says right here. It says, he who spared not his own son, but gave him up for us all, how shall he not with his son also freely give us all things? So look at what he's saying here. I gave my highest possession, which is my son. So now all these other possessions is mediocre. So having money and wealth and riches and houses and lands and cars and all those materialistic blessings is mediocre to the main gift, which is Jesus. But the Bible is telling you in Romans 8.32 that he will freely give you all these things because even the father has broken through in his highest seed. Look at what the father is saying. I done broke open in sowing and giving you all things because I sold my best. Now that I sold my best, you can have whatever you like. Now, this is in the word of God, mind you. Wow. I don't know how a child of God can hear this word and not begin to start dreaming the word in your life. I'm talking to you right now to prosper your soul. I'm not worried about prospering your finances because I'm already anointed for finances. I already have a mantle on me for money for supernatural money. I'm just talking to you to get you in the mindset so that your mind won't resist this anointing. Because remember, no anointing can flow in your life if your mind is adversarial to it. I'm already anointed for high wealth. I'm just giving you, I, I, you know, I'm not, I'm not trying to convince you that this is real. I already know that this is real. Uh, 2 Samuel chapter 12, verse 8. Look what it says here. Second Samuel chapter 12, verse 8. God is speaking to David. Well, this will, that, that text will probably take you somewhere else. 
Wow. No, no, I need to talk that. This is the raw anointing. Uh, 2 Samuel chapter 12, verse 8. is the raw anointing. Look what the Lord says. The Lord is talking to King David here. The Lord says to King David, he says this. He says, and I gave you your master's house and your master's wives and I pit them in your bosom. It's a raw anointing. God is telling David, I gave you your master's house and I pit all the women that belong to him and I pit them in your hands. I gave them to you. And look, he said, I gave you the house of Israel and all of Judah. Wow. Man, this text sign else. This text sign else. This is the creator of the universe telling King David, I've given you your master's house. I've given you all the wives that was belonging to your master. Wait a daggone minute here. We're going to have a moment of silence. <laughs> now, I don't care if you're offended. I don't care if you're offended. I'm, I'm, ta I'm talking with the Bible say. So, if this offends you, good. You got demons inside of you. You got, you have to be free. I got to read this tag on text again. I won't get about two people. I won't get two people. This is shocking to me. It is shocking to me. It is, oh my gosh. This is shocking. I have given you your master's house and I've given you all the wives that your master had into your keeping. And I gave you the house of Israel and all of Judah. And he said, if that had been too little, I also would have given you much more. Wait. No, 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 no. No, you can't say that, Lord. They, they didn't. No, no, they can't say that. Now, saints, here's why I want you to magnify this text. I would have given you much more. The Lord is telling David, I'm in partnership to satisfy your dreams. Child of God, you must know this when you're sowing the much more anointing. No, no, let me say it like this. The much more mantle. The Lord all about satisfying your mouth with good things. Psalm 103. Uh, is that Psalm 103? He said, if that was too little for you, no, oh, Jesus, wait, why is God talking to King David like this? I thought that that's out of pocket. God tells him, if what I gave you was too small, I would have gave you much more. If you thought it was too little, I would have gave you so much more. And saints, how many of you are children of God? Feel like your financial situation is too small. And God is telling you, if you think that it is little, I could give you much more. If you think that what you're making in a month is too little, I can give you much more. If you think what you have is too little, I can give you much more. See, you got to get in your mind how God thinks so that it will break you open to honor him with what you currently have. Because you'll realize that what you currently have, I got to give that to him so that he can unlock to me what he currently has for me. And what he currently has for me is what me really wants all along.
So he tells David, I would have given you much more. Because he's telling David, I got an unlimited supply. So if you think that where you're living right now is too small, if you think that your finance is too small, you think that your level of health is too small, you, you need some more health, you need bigger health in your body, I could give you much more. Saints, could I read this again to you? I'm going to show you. Second Samuel says this. Wow. See, saints, if you don't read this word of God, Satan, Satan going to rob you. If you don't read this word of God, and that's what he's been doing to the children of God for the longest. And then there's other people that don't understand this money anointing of Jesus Christ. Uh, let me say it correctly. Money anointing of King Jesus Christ. The money anointing of King Jesus. Because Christ is his position, is his functionality. It's the realm that you can take on of Jesus and become just like him. Christ is the realm that you can take on of Jesus and become just like him. Christ is anointed one. When you become anointed one, look, look what the Bible says, touch not my anointed ones. That's the Christ. Those are people that have become just like Jesus. If you don't read this word of God, you're going to live in lack and you're a child of God unnecessarily. Why? You have a money anointing in the blood that belongs to you. You have a financial power of the Holy Spirit that you haven't worn yet. You have wealth favor and wealth grace and wealth wisdom that you have not tapped into yet. So look what the Lord said. I've given you your master's household and I have placed all the master's wives right in your arms. I gave you Israel and Judah. And if this had been too little, I would have given you much more. Look at what the Lord is talking that talk to David. He's telling him, if you think that what I already gave to you is too small, well, guess what I'm going to do? I'm going to give you so much more. I could have given that to you. Now, here's what's so powerful here. You see the mindset of the father, how he's constantly seeking to give you extra. He's seeking to give you surplus and abundance is on his mind. The much more mantle. The much more mantle. Wow. You know, I am drunk. I'm drunk in the spirit. I'm drunk off of this word. word. I've been intoxicated with this lifestyle. I'm drunk in the spirit. I have received this word in my life and I'm living this word. So I am drunk in this word. I'm not drunk, drunk with natural wine, but I am drunk with this spiritual word. And this has changed my whole life. So this real to me. See, as I'm talking to you right now, the power of the Holy Spirit coming through the screen. If you are listening to me from a pure heart. Now, if you judging me and you trying up there, you trying to contradict me, you, you going to miss. But I've been sent amongst you. I, I, I'm a I'm a Abraham in this generation. I'm an Abraham in this generation. 
And I've seen the blessing of Abraham and I'm seeing the blessing of Abraham. Saints, I got so much, I got so much materialistic possessions that when I walk into my materialistic possessions, I get confused for a brief minute. I got so much watches, so much rings, so much clothes, so much shoes that I get confused. You can have so much clothes that you get confused on what you should wear or when you should wear it. Mind you, the father had me sew all my clothes. I know that the seed works. The Lord want to make you an Abrahamic partaker. And since you imagine, I'm still a young man. I'm still in my 20s. You see what I'm saying? The father told me I was his apostle. The father had told me I was his prophet years ago. But then the father came to me and told me, you my apostle. That's why I let you go through things. That's why I let you go through the gates of hell. That's why I let you face things in life. Because that was the training to inaugurate you an apostle. You know, sometimes people say that you can't become a prophet. That's a lie. You can become anything you want in the kingdom of God. As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. You can become anything you want. You can become a prophet. I've heard a lot of people say, it's impossible for somebody to become a prophet. They got to be born a prophet. You tell me where in the scriptures was Elisha prophesying. Elisha was not prophesying nowhere in the text. God said, go anoint him. You see what I'm saying? Anoint mean go give him the power, the position to become. He made him a prophet. He was not a prophet prior. So, so even that doctrine is wrong. People can become a prophet. That if you honor a prophet, if you listen to a prophet, if you follow a prophet, their anointing will come off on you. And when their anointing come off on you, your experience, that position, that functionality becoming your own. You can snatch mantles from people. If you listen to them, you honor them. You can snatch the mantle that they're wearing and walk in the mantle that they're wearing. Saints was the apostles. Were they apostles all the time? No. But Jesus trained them and apostleship came upon them. That's what goes on. You, you receive what you um, respect, what you honor, what you sow into. That's what you take upon your life. That's what you start moving in. That's what you start producing, birthing, manifesting. I wasn't born an apostle. I was inaugurated as an apostle. The Lord made me an apostle. I'm still prophet Joshua Holmes, but I'm an apostle. If you ever studied my ministry, that's what I move in the demonstration of the spirit and power because I'm an apostle of God. We have people that say if somebody is real, they won't have to tell you who they are. Wow. Also, if a police officer comes up to your window and say, I'm officer, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm officer uh, Mildred. And you look at the officer and say, no, you're a fake officer because you just told me who you were. Wow. You going to jail, buddy. No, you're not a real officer because if you was an officer, you wouldn't have told me that you're officer Mildred. You're going to jail. 
you uh, might as well just prepare. You go into jail. Or you you experience um, your your mother. You disrespect your mother and your mother tell you, don't disrespect me. I'm your mother. No, no, no. I'm going to disrespect you. You're not my mother. Because if you was my mother, you would not have told me that you was my mother. How smart thou art. How wise thou art. You got those people say, oh, you know, you know, if somebody is a real prophet, they won't say that they're a prophet. Oh, so you go to a doctor and the doctor come in the room and say, hey, I'm Dr. Green. How are you doing today? Oh, oh no, no, no. You're not no Dr. Green. I'm Dr. Green. I'm just introducing me. No, if you was a doctor, you would not have told me that you was a doctor. You see how stupid that sound? You go up to McDonald's. And you go up to the window, they say, welcome to McDonald's. How may I take your order? And you say, no, 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 this ain't McDonald's. Because if it was McDonald's, if it was really McDonald's, you wouldn't have told me that this was McDonald's. You see how dumb that sounds? You see how dumb that sounds? But people say, if you say who you are, that means that you're not it. No, no, no. If I say who I am, it means I actually am it. As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. But you can become, you can move up in the fivefold ministry. The Bible says, he that is faithful over a few things, the Lord makes him rule over much. When you are faithful over a few things, he makes you rule over much. So imagine he has you as an evangelist, you master evangelist. He might move you up to profit. And it's needed because now when you're evangelizing, you're going to be able to prophesy too. And be able to speak into people's life, which is a very powerful thing. Or he may move you up to apostle. So you, you, might, you might up there start moving in different type of diverse miracles. You might demonstrate the power stronger. That's what goes on. So is uh is available to you. Now, let's go to Proverbs chapter 8, verse 18. Riches and honor are with me. Yes, durable riches and righteousness. Now, saints, I want I want to deal with this. That righteousness is the way that God does things. And how does he get riches and wealth to you and durable riches to you and honor in your life where people will invest to you is through the sowing anointing. Father, I received the sowing anointing. Remember what Jesus said, if you give it shall be given. And he said, men shall give into your bosom. That overflowing. It shows you that if you are going to activate riches, durable riches and honor in your life, which means that men going to give into your bosom, they're going to invest in you. You got to embrace the sowing anointing. You have to be trained not to eat money when it comes into your hands, but to pit the work of God first. And not only do that, name your seed because God want to give you a harvest. I just dealt with the fact that the Lord was telling uh, David in 2 Samuel 12, 8, that I would have gave you so much more if that was little. If what you had was little to you, I would have gave you so much more. So I read that text to let you know how God thinks. He want to give you so much more. So name your seed. Don't just sow money into the work of God, but name that seed what you want to happen. When you name your seed, you take an authority in the spirit realm to loose what you're naming. Whatever you name your seed is going to occur. Sometimes people miss that the name of their seed did manifest. Sometimes people say, Lord, I named this seed that you would protect me. And then all of a sudden people start leaving your life. And, and then they say, well, Lord, I named that you would protect me. Why are you having this person leave my life and they're protecting me? And the Lord said, no. If you're not smart, you're going to miss. 
you name that seed, the Lord protect you. That's why he got those people out of your life. To protect you. Lord, I want you to take me higher. Then you see God start disconnecting you from all type of people. And then you say, Lord, I told you to take me higher. I need these people around me. They've been nice to me. I want to. And the Lord said, no, that, that's been stopping you from going higher. You can miss harvests on what your seed produce. And one of the major things that you're going to see when you're sowing into your man of God, your God ordained soul, whoever your prophet is, whoever God has picked to feed you the word and give you revelation, while you're sowing into their soul, you're going to see that their all comes off on you. You see the type of lifestyle I live, the lifestyle of blessing and abundance. You can't sow into me and not live that type of lifestyle. Because that's what my soul produces. That's what my all distributes. The two major anointings that I move in is wisdom and joy. So it's impossible for you to sow into me and not receive wisdom and joy. Those are the two major anointings. Those are how I do miracles, signs, and wonders. Those are how I do healings. Those are how I cast out devils. Those are how I move in deliverance ministry. Those are how I move in wealth. Through wisdom and joy. So, name your seed. You don't just want to sow and say, I'm sowing out of the kindness of my heart. That's not wisdom. You need a harvest back on what you sowed so that you can keep on sowing and keep on being a blessing to yourself and those that are around you. The Lord is all about you increasing more and more. Let's go to Psalm 115 verse 14. He want to increase you more and more. He's all about that. He don't want you to stop at a certain level and say, okay, I've arrived. No, no, keep on going further in the financial anointing. And you can prophesy your money. Decree money cometh. God gave that revelation to Apostle Leroy Thompson. But you yourself decree that decree money cometh in your life. I used to do that when I was sowing. I used to pull money cometh. And while I was sowing, it worked. Financial increase became a servant to me. Money became a servant to me. And I called in money manifestations. I begin to walk through wealth gates. And finances started to locate me in my life. See, saints, money is spiritual. Uh, people have tried to make it natural, but money is spiritual. And, and once you are a sower, you have spiritual authority over money. And you can command money. You can prophesy money. You can decree that money is loosed in your life. Money thou art loose in my life. Psalm 115 verse 14 says, The Lord shall increase you more and more, you and your children. So the word of God is telling you that God is all about increasing you. So you're not just sowing out of the kindness of your heart. You're sowing because you're unlocking and manifesting God's plan for you to be rich. You're unlocking God's plans for you to have abundance. And it's all the will of God. You're not stepping out of his will. Now, let's read this here. Mark, uh, Matthew chapter 9, verse 37 says, Then the Lord Jesus said to his disciples, The harvest truly is plentiful. Plenteous, but the laborers are few. Pray ye the Lord of the harvest that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. Now, saints, this is dealing with souls, yes. But there's also a harvest for money.
there's a harvest anointing for money. Because that goes in line with Genesis 8. As long as the earth remains, there'll be seed time and harvest. There's a harvest anointing for money cometh and supernatural money moving in your life. For financial wealth. And so he's the Lord of the harvest. Every kind of harvest, Jesus has authority over that harvest. So let me show you something in the word of God. Let's go to 2 Corinthians 9. He's the Lord of the harvest. He's the Lord of the harvest. So let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 9. Let's go to verse 10. It says, now he that ministered seed to the sower. See, you got to be a sower. You have to be someone that perpetually takes what God puts in your hands and offers it up to your man of God, to your priest, to your to, to your ministerial assignment to get the gospel going forth. Honoring your man of God. It says, now he that ministers seed to the sower, both minister bread for your food and multiply your seed sown and increase the fruits of your righteousness. So we see here that sowing, it, it, it makes you more righteous. It gives you more fruitfulness more visibility. So sowing is the activity of righteousness. Everybody share this broadcast. Invite your followers.